Catalyst is a unique five-year government-backed business development program that unlocks the vast potential of economic partnerships between Australia and Indonesia. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners are warned that the following episode may contain voices of deceased persons. The humble sea cucumber may have been the first commodity ever traded between Australia and Indonesia. In our final episode of the year, we'll take you on a journey back 400 or more years when traders from Makassar ventured to the northern shores of Australia in pursuit of, you guessed it, sea cucumbers. When the Kassam people came over here to harvest sea cucumbers, what were the terms of trade? They were obviously getting something out of it. What did the Yolngu people want in return? Kaliko. The Kaliko is the uh, cerons, mm-hmm. um, giving a rice. Never, people used to never eat rice. There was a knife, um, axis, um, canoe. They would carry all the way from Indonesia, a couple of canoes. So it wasn't just sea cucumbers. There was a lot of trade going on. Yeah, I think we were the first people to, to, to work with other countries. Are there other signs of Macassan influence here? Yeah, yeah of course. We have a, um, a plant called uh, tamarind trees. When we see tamarind trees, we, we know that Macassan people were here. That was author Benjamin Law speaking to Jawa Burawanga, Bawaka traditional elder, while visiting Bawaka on the east coast of East Arnhem Land in Australia back in 2011. As you heard, the Yongu of East Arnhem Land traded sea cucumbers for calico, rice, knives, axes, and even canoes carried all the way from Makassar. And the legacy of that time remains today. All of the cultural influence of the Makassans is now expressed in uh, rituals, song cycles, sacred design, repertoire, um, and all sorts of objects, and especially paintings. So now we have um, this great tradition expressed in very subtle ways throughout Arnhem Land. That was Professor Marsha Langton from the University of Melbourne speaking back in 2011 about the rich legacy that remains today from those earliest trading relationships. The men who came south to fish are often called Macassans, but they actually came from many different parts of what's now Indonesia. The Dutch East Indies, as it was known from the 17th century onwards, was under Dutch rule. Um, Indonesian people still had to make a living, so where they would traditionally hunt for tree pang in local waters, that supply was now under high demand with colonial trade interests. So they started pushing further south towards Australia and we started seeing fishing camps turning up all along the Northern Territory coast as well as Western Australia. That was ABC journalist Erin Park speaking to members of an expedition studying the history of the sea cucumber trade. A man who knows a lot about this fascinating period of history is Dr. Priyambudi Solistianto from the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at Australia's Flinders University. Rachel and I caught up with Pak Budi recently. Pak Budi, thank you for joining us on the Catalyst podcast. To start with, you travelled to the Gama Festival in Northern Australia earlier this year. Can you tell us what that was like? Yes, thank you, Rachel and Sonda. Um, middle of this year, I decided to participate in Gama Festival. Gama Festival is a, a premier indigenous festival organized and sponsored by Yotu Yindi Foundation, which has already been there for almost 20 years. And during the past two years, was was stopped because of, uh, as you know, pandemic. But this year, uh, it was on again, and I joined and I participated. So the Traveling was a bit um, uh, complicated 
not in the sense uh, going run and run, but basically I have to fly from Adelaide to Keynes, and then from Keynes I flew to Gulf. Gulf is uh, an airport, basically a mining airport in Annam Land, not far from Nulumboy. So I stop over in Nulumboy for a night, and then uh, we moved to Gama Festival, which was held in more or less 30k south of Kuf Airport. So it's belong to group of Yonglu uh, clan, basically organized festival. It's a beautiful one. So this year was very special because also year where our new prime minister, not new by now, then uh, Anthony Albanese came with his delegates basically to consult the voices. The voices basically uh, new or not new, so much new for all of us, but new in the sense that they're trying to bring the voices uh, piece from the Uluru uh, statement into constitution which require referendum. And I'm very pleased to be here in Makassar that of course has uh, centuries of involvement going back to the trade that occurred between seafarers here in Makassar and uh, the Yulnu people of Arnhem Land. So he went there to consult and to um, inform them that there will be a referendum next year perhaps to decide whether Australian would willing to have the forces in the constitution. So for myself, it was very good because <laughs> I've been doing, as you know, uh, research and also been doing a um, series of study tour supported or sponsored then by New Colombo Plan with my students, Flinders University students, to Makassar to study the relationship which we will discuss. So back to the Kama Festival, for me it was an introduction into the world of Yonglu people where the relationship between them with the Makassan, the Makassan is a broader concept, uh, not just uh, Makassaris, Pukis, including also Maduranis, Japanese, Rotes, Pimas, who were in the crew of the uh, relationship that carry them tripang, which we'll discuss. So I was there and I learned lots about that relationship and I can share with you later if you want to ask me. But for me, as an Indonesian, middle-aged Indonesian, been living in Australia for 30 years and then introduced myself into that world, it was fascinating. So. That was the highlight of my year this year. So still at the festival, Babudi, what Indonesian influence did you observe there? Good question. Basically, we didn't have Indonesia then, as you know. We only have Makassan. So the influence were significant because in Pongols is the ritual dancing held every late afternoon yeah, until night. Couple of uh, ritual dancing or ritual dancing, uh, which carries flag, meaning that that flags um, depicted the boat, Patiwakang boat, who arrived in Northern Australia. That's number one. Number two, in language loans, there were a couple of hundreds words that spoken by Yolu were basically uh, originated from the relationship with the Makassan. For instance, reference for white people in Australia, indigenous uh, First Nation people, in that part of South Australia is Balanda, which for all of us in Indonesia, those who study Indonesia, is referred to Holanda or Belanda, yeah? orang Belanda. Yeah? And then words for boss, or our, you know, our boss, you know, is Pungawa. Or Pungawa, which is basically um, Pukis words or Makassar is Pukis for boss, super, you know, someone that above us. 
and then the words for currency, rupiah, the words for bread, roti, and the words for west, parat. There's a couple of other words, eh? which basically part of the everyday life spoken language. And then the influence of the relationship can be found now through archaeological and anthropological and musicological research were or have been in uh, pictures of the put, Makassan put or Patiwakan, in rocks and also in painting. Painting means in the pub paintings. Paintings that depicted the relationship in the form of the put, as well as in recent time in the form of sales. Because the this year tells the winner of the competition was basically an artist, Yonglu artist, who paint the sales of uh, Patiwakan, the Makassan uh, uh, boat, and other things as well. I cannot describe, but they were very friendly towards me because I introduced myself as an Indonesian, been to Makassar many times, and they said, yo, yo, you know, nice to see you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Definitely some traces there uh, of Makassar and of, of early Indonesian history, such as through words. Um, but if you could take us back to the 16th or 17th century, or perhaps was it the 18th century that was a, that was the beginning of, of this history when fishermen from Makassar would travel to northern Australia to trade sea, cucum, uh, sea cucumbers. Uh, tell us what we know about that time. Okay, so what we do know now, based on archaeological evidence in the forms of writings and books, basically uh, an important book published about this, was by uh, Campbell McKnight. Then most of other archeological evidence uh, referred to as early as uh, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. But we never know, maybe beyond that, as early as 16th centuries. The evidence that we can find now that you can also refer to is the, uh, the Diary of Matthew Flinders, which refer to in one of the notes, uh, saw lots of prows. Prow is the boat uh, referred to in Malay. He, they saw many of them, not in one or but in a group of prows, which is in northern part of Australia. That's all basically from Matthew Flinders' um, uh, travelogues. Uh, so if we refer back to them, uh, to be honest, maybe begin from you know 16, 17, 18 centuries until the government of then South Australia, who also um, Northern Territory was underneath, uh, stopped the threat in 1907. It's really fascinating this information that that we have about the, this period of time and. You've said in the past that that we learn a lot through oral history as well as song and dance. I think there may even be some paintings uh, that remain that, that teach us about that time. What are the main sources of information that you look to about this period of history? Well, because I was an academic or I was in academia until end of last year. So throughout 20 years, I've been also living and studying in Australia and learn more about this relationship. But for me as an Indonesian, now of course I'm an Aussie as well, but I must admit and have big respect to this group of sailors yeah, or seamen, because there was no woman then, uh, who travel back and forth for centuries looking for tripang. But it's not just about the tripang because it's, it's so, about relationship, relationship in a multi-dimensional. For instance, um, during the time during the time when they have uh, across, or particularly in uh, Arnhem Land, northern part of Australia, um, they also respect the locals. Um, meaning that they set up the home base, 
along the coast and they now live with the locals. However, the locals and them work together in the tripang processing. Uh, I call it multinational cooperation because at the time was we didn't have national state there. So they already done in a way that it was valuable because tripang was a premium commodities uh, during the centuries and exported to China, Guangzhou, and also Xiamen uh, via port of Makassar. Yeah. Makassar, as you know, has been until now the kit for Eastern Indonesia. But the important thing of the relationship also human relationship. Um, I do not know evidence in statistical, but there were evidence of intermarriage, evidence of relationship that beyond commercial and respect with each other. There were, of course, uh, evidence of conflicts, but in the sense, the Makassan did not go there like the white people from Europe or from uh, Great Britain to occupy and to colonize the continent, right? So there is two different things. The last that also important is for many of Yonglu people, the arrival of Makassan very significant because follow the winds that coming from north to the north part of Australia, south from uh, Makassar, and then back again carry with them the commodity to Port Makassar around April or May. And that relationship, of course, uh, every year they waiting. So one of the songs that I loved when I was quite young in the 90s or mid or late 90s is Makassan Crew. If you're not familiar, please check it out at Yoto Yindi. Yoto Yindi is one of the top band, uh, indigenous band, that uh, very popular at the time when I just settled in Australia. So I'm talking early 90s, mid 90s, etc. So I saw myself the concept of Yoto Yindi was a woman in Adelaide. But one of the songs, Makassan Crew, depicted how young Lu people waiting. Uh, year after year, centuries after centuries, the arrival of the Makassan crew. So some, some. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a bit, a bit in this now because I remember vividly when I was in Arnhem Land that song. And for me, it's important that some Indonesian or we in Indonesia should. Uh, Proud of their relationship because we the one who engage uh, directly with the the owner of this continent, which is of course the younger people, the First Nation. Babudi, I followed your documentary uh, throughout Makassar or what is now Makassar, and um, I think one of your findings is that it was hard to f- to to trace evidence or what is left from the Tripang trading days, at least on the Makassar side, there was more evidence on the Australian side um, that was documented. Was there anything important or anything noteworthy that you could share with us from your travels to Makassar? Yes, um, there's a good point. From the time when I went there for the first time, 2014, until just a few weeks ago, I discovered uh, bit by bit the relationship can be found in Makassar. The evidence, of course, uh, can be found in Museum Kota Makassar, but not much in Museum Fort Rotterdam, because the Museum of Rotter- Fort Rotterdam hosted La Galico um, historical uh, kind of narrative. So what happened with this uh, Makassar link? So it was very challenging. So I talked with a number of people, talked with artists, local people, uh, historian, uh, people who understand their relationship. Until today, I haven't been able to find or uh, met the 
grandchildren or great great grandchildren of the sailors. However, what we can find now, or what we can understand more and more now, is basically through the boat making. So we we like to begin, or we, me, and other Indonesian artists and friends like to uh, trace back through the ritual, the ceremonies, or the oral history of how the local people, particularly in Tanaperu, which is located in Pulukumba district, uh, about 200k from Makassar, the process or the history or oral history or ritual of the making of Pinisi. Pinisi is basically a latest version of Patiwakan, which is the boat that traveled back and forth for centuries. So um, other than that, we cannot find any evidence in a way that you can find in Northern Australia. I might not be the right person to investigate that, but uh, through tracing the families of green chitons, um, it's very difficult. It's going to be challenging because the history of the traveler was the history of ordinary people. Ordinary people means yeah, um, sailors or seamen who has no knowledge, who, who has great knowledge, but not accompanied by the writing of the travelogues or journals when they travel, unlike the European or other, even the Chinese you know, has someone who write the uh, maritime uh, uh, journeys, but not this group of people. So, yes, uh, that is the challenge in most of that I have found in the recent trip as well. So with these challenges that you mentioned, what can we learn from this early trade relationship and what it means about the Australia-Indonesia relationship? Okay, um, to answer that question, I have two um, ideas. One is perhaps we need to mobilize or ask different constituent stakeholders to pull together how to find resources to collect oral histories, memories, and also evidence of that trace in South Sulawesi. I'm not saying not important in Northern Australia because they already been done. So what we will need is uh, to do it or to find out on the Indonesian side, which is in South Sulawesi. Number two, of course, we need to convince of that stakeholder, particularly government in Indonesian side, uh, either at district level or in uh, provincial level, South Sulawesi as well as in Pulukumba and other parts of South Sulawesi, to mapping out uh, the families or the networks of the families whom the great great grand ancestors travel to uh, Northern Australia. So that requires resources, and I don't have much resources. If Catalyst can help me to find resources, that would be great. Number two is begin to end that process also, documenting that process of finding those uh, traces so that we will have digital evidence that would be useful for the future generation. It would certainly be really interesting to see those networks mapped and and I think it's a period of history that is unknown to certainly many Australians and I'm sure many Indonesians too, but it is it is so special. And it's timely that you are you're currently in Bali where the G20 conference is on. What would you like to see in the future for our trading relationship in terms of of policy and and, and other other initiatives you'd like to see taken forward yes um well i'm here at the moment i've been traveling to south sulawesi and then Jakarta and then here i think i have to refer back to uh, the trips of new prime minister just a week i think after he was um, inaugurated, or I was at that time in Adelaide, that he traveled to Jakarta and then to Makassar with 
Minister Penny Wong and a couple of um, other uh, DFAT people. And then from Makassar, uh, at, in Makassar, he gave lectures at Hasanuddin University uh, campus where I always been taking my student there. And then in the speech, uh, Prime Minister Albanese said that or reminded that relationship, long centuries of important relationship. And then he also came up with that the future of in the coming months or years, foreign policies of Australia in the region will also be reflected the views and the spirit of First Nations. Okay, so that was his promise. So now I'm asking that promise to be implemented, meaning that in that relationship, we need to strengthen the link between Makassar and at least Darwin through opening up the corridor of that part of Northern Australia with Eastern part of Indonesia into different kind of relationship. Could be trade, could be also education, could be also tourism, pariwisata, could also be a, a special package, I call it Jalur Tripang, arts exchange that require the representation of South Sulawesi, either artist or intellectual or anyone, people's to people links in Gama Festival. Because the latest or the last one South Sulawesian artists performed or present was in 2005 Gama Festival. Since then, we never seen them. I was the only Indonesian, as I know, this year at Gama Festival. I'm not from Sulawesi, but I'm a Makassan because if we took the broader concept of Makassan, I was belong to Makassan because maybe my ancestor also a crew from Madura or from Java, right? <laughs> but Makassan is broader concept. So I think from the top to bottom, the concrete that we can do is, I hope the presence of artists or whoever to represent South Australia, eh, sorry, South Sulawesi can be present in Gamma Festival. And that requires sponsor because it's quite expensive to go to Gamma Festival. So am I answering your question? Yes, Babudi, you definitely did. Well, thank you again for your time. And as you mentioned, people to people links are definitely key to making the bilateral relationships or any relationships really work. Thanks again for your time, Dr. Priyambudi Sulistianto. Sama sama. Well, listeners, that was our final episode for the year. Perhaps you'll be having sea cucumber on your dinner plate in the coming weeks. We thank you for joining us over the last four episodes and we look forward to bringing you more on the Catalyst podcast in January 2023.